All right, so tonight, um, Pastor Ben and I and pastors are going to be talking about one thing that um, God has laid on our heart that we feel you should know as you go back to school. But even if you're not in school, I believe these things apply to any age. So just grab hold of it and receive from God tonight. So um, the thing tonight that God has laid on my heart for you is that God wants to use you, so be bold with what he asks of you. Um, and so for kids, what does that mean that God wants to use you? Like, that seems just kind of strange. But God wants to put you into action. He wants to have you tell other people about Jesus. He wants you to pray for other people. Whatever he may lead you to do, he wants, to, he wants you to do it. So he wants to put you into action. He wants to use you. So tonight, we're going to talk about three people in the Bible um, that you might not feel like, wow, uh, God wants to use them or God used them, but he used them in mighty, mighty ways. And um, so the first one we're going to talk about is David, actually. And God used David as a young boy. And I'm going to paraphrase these three different people's Bible stories. So I put a reference um, on these graphics for you to go back through if you'd like to and read the story in detail. But um, the first thing with David is um, Saul was king at this specific time. And Saul, he had started to fail to follow God's word and God's direction. And so what God said is he wanted Samuel, um, God's special helper, he wanted Samuel to go find a new king. And so he had, um, Samuel went to this man named Jesse's house, and Jesse had lots of different sons. And these sons were very handsome and super strong. So they fit the part of someone that could possibly be the king. But when Samuel saw these guys, the Lord spoke to his heart that none of them were the king. And so Samuel was so confused by this. He's like, but Lord, they're handsome and strong. Like, one of these guys surely is the king. And, and the Lord said, no, no, Samuel. Um, so Samuel said, Jesse, do you have any other sons? Are these really all of your sons? And Jesse said, well, I have another son, but um, he's young, and he's working in the field with the sheep right now, so you probably just don't want to see him. But Samuel said, bring him to me. And when um, Samuel saw him, David, he was like, that's it. That's the king. And so Samuel anointed him as king because guess what? God doesn't look at the outside. He doesn't look what like man looks at the outside, but God looks at the heart. And God knew that David had his heart. And so um, another super familiar passage that has to do with David as well would be the story of David and Goliath. And here we see David's boldness coming out. Um, so this is uh, uh, this time David or his older brothers, they were out fighting with um, King Saul and they were in battle. And um, David was working in the field with the sheep. And um, David's um, dad asked him to bring the boys lunch. And so David went and brought them lunch. And when he got there, he saw that all of God's army was afraid of something. And they were afraid of their enemy. And who was that enemy, kids? Goliath. Yeah, Goliath was huge. He was big. And Goliath made fun of God. And Goliath made fun of God's people and God's army. But you know who stood up to him? David. David, a young boy named David, stood up to this big giant Goliath. You know why? Because he knew who God was. He had God's heart. And God had his heart. And so David, he took out his sling, and he took his stone, and he shot it, and it landed right between Goliath's eyes, and Goliath died. So David defeated Goliath. David had God's heart, and he was bold. So then we're going to look at Gideon. And I just think this story is pretty cool as well, but um, the Lord... The Lord wanted to use Gideon to defeat their enemies, the Midianites. 
okay? That's what they're called. The Midianites, they went into the Israelites' land, and they stole all their crops and just destroyed everything. And the Israelites were like, Lord, help us. And you know what, what the Lord did? He sent an angel to go talk to Gideon. And Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, Gideon, you mighty warrior. So the Lord called out who Gideon was. He said, you mighty warrior, even though Gideon, he was just sitting under a tree and, you know, he's like, me, God, me, a mighty warrior? You, you want me to defeat the Midianites? Me? And the Lord said, go, Gideon, I am with you. Go save Israel. And Gideon again is like, God, I am the weakest in the town. I am the weakest in my family. I, I don't know about this. But you know what? As he spent more and more time with God, he was like, okay, God, I'll do it. And so he went out. He gathered his army of 32,000 people, and he went up against the Midianites who had an army of 135,000 people. And you know what God said? I don't want you to take that many men. I don't even want you to take 35,000 men. I want you to take 300 men to defeat that army of 135,000. Holy moly. <laughs> but you know what? Gideon was bold. The Lord told him to go defeat them. And Gideon was bold and stood strong to defeat them. And so Gideon, he did it. He took 300 men. The Lord even gave him a strategy. And he said, here's how you're going to defeat them. In the middle of the night, you're going to surround their camp. So just picture this. 135,000 men in armor probably laying all over the ground sleeping, okay? And these 300 men were surrounding the camp. And the Lord said, all right, I want you to make a bunch of noise. I want you to break jars, blow trumpets, yell. And you know what happened? I mean, if you were in dead sleep, you'd be a little startled, right? <laughs> so the Midianites, they turned on each other, and they started fighting and killing one another. And there you go again. God used Gideon to defeat them. So Gideon was confident in God, but he wasn't at first. At first he thought, I'm weak. I can't do this, God. But you know what? God spoke to him, and he said, you mighty warrior. And so he could hold on to that word, and he knew who he was. He knew what God asked him to do. He could be bold and do what God asked him to do. And then the last person we're going to look at is Moses. And I'm really going to summarize this really short, but you see Moses, um, God wanted him to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He wanted to set them free. And Moses, he didn't feel like he was good enough to be in charge of doing that. He said, God, I can't even speak. I stutter when I speak. And you want me to lead people? You want me to lead all the Israelites out of the land of Egypt? But God said yes. And you know what? Moses, not, he didn't um, just struggle with stuttering. He was even, like, doubting God. Like, he, he didn't have all the answers. And he didn't think that people would even believe what he was saying. So he had the fear of man. But God, he kept speaking to Moses. And Moses kept spending time with God. And he was able to know God even more and know what God wanted of him. And so he could lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So all of these people that we talked about tonight, they, again, is summarized real quickly, but there's references. But all these people, they had a choice to make when God called upon them. Am I going to step out and accept what God is saying about me, or am I not going to? But you know what they did? They chose to do it, and they did it boldly, and they were victorious with what God told them. God does not look at Who's the prettiest? Who's the handsomest? Who knows it all? Who's the smartest? Who um, is the most knowledgeable in this or that? But you know what? He looks at your heart. Does God have your heart? Does he have it where you would say, God, I will do anything for you. What do you want me to do? Does he have your heart tonight? And so this school year, I just want to reiterate that God does want to use you, and he wants you to be bold to step out with what he asks of you. All right, so Pastor Ben. Yeah. 
I love that. That was, <laughs> I love you guys. You're making me blush up here, okay? Um, man, that was awesome, Machina. Um, you know, we see with David, this is right on, this is so cool, because we haven't talked at all, and, and I was just asking the Lord, what do you want to say? And, and I'm right in this, this same vein with what she just said. But uh, what I wanted to say coming up here was, what did David do with Goliath? He confronted him. What did Gideon do with the Midianites? He confronted them. And this word confront, it actually is a word that I want to talk to you tonight about. Uh, it's, it's a part of the definition of the word, actually, that I want to talk to you about. The word that I kept hearing in my heart was courage. And so I looked up this word uh, in, the, in the dictionary. What is courage? You know that courage is a Bible word? So this is cool. Listen to this. Courage is the willingness to confront agony. Pain, danger, uncertainty, or intimidation. And if I could say anything to our students, to our adults, to our little children, whoever, whoever is in this building tonight, I would say to you this. We need some courage. We need to up our game on courage. And how do we do that? We begin to form this picture of ourselves by what God says concerning me. Right? And so we're going to look at this picture in the Bible. There's actually somebody that I want to talk to you tonight about. And uh, his name is Joshua, but I want to just say this. Why is courage needed? Courage is needed because in a world where many people just go with the flow, we need some people to go against the flow. And that's what courage looks like. And so uh, I believe um, tonight what we can do is we can confront some things. And so uh, maybe you're in this place tonight and you've been dealing with fear. Or maybe you're in this place tonight and you've been dealing with an ailment. Or maybe you're in this place tonight and you're having problems in your marriage. Or maybe you're in this place tonight and you're just a little kid at school getting bullied. You know that you can confront that? And we're going to do it tonight, okay? So I want you to stand up. Because this is what confrontation looks like. It looks like knowing your enemy and going at them, right? Now, our enemy is unseen, but we got a voice, right? I just saw this in my heart while Machina was talking, that we would confront these things that are coming against us. You know what I mean? And you as a little kid, my little Carson, he's five, six years old. You know that God looks at him, and he sees a mighty man of God. And he's just a little guy, right? But he's got a lot of spunk, let me tell you. <laughs> so I want you to say this with me. Fear, Fear. go. That's what it looks like to confront. When you're at home, little kids, when you're at home in bed at night and, and, and that spirit is speaking to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come out under your bed. You know that you can stand up and say, in the name of Jesus, get out of my room. That's what, that's what it looks like to confront. And so you're going to see this picture. I want you to say it again. Fear, Fear. go. go. Fear, Fear. Get, out get out of here. You can do that. And when you get home tonight, you're dealing with ailments in your body, a headache, things like that, and, you know, just issues in your family. Speak. Confront it. Don't let it just go on. Kick it to the curb and say, I have authority over you. Amen? That's what courage looks like. You guys can go ahead and sit back down. I'm going to get back into this real quick. Okay, so we're talking about a guy by the name of Joshua. I love this fella. He was a son of a nun, right? <laughs> Ever seen Nacho Libre? <laughs> I gotta, every time I read that, I see that. So I got to say it like that. Joshua was the son of a nun, right? <clears throat> Check this out in verse 1 of Joshua chapter 1. It says, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of a nun, Moses' assistant. And he said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead. Young people, Children, moms, dads, the time has come for you to lead. No more waiting for somebody else to do the job. You got a job to do. And in order to get it done, we got to be courageous and make it happen. Amen? So how are we going to do this? Look at, listen to this. It says, the Israelites, uh, you are the, the time has come uh, for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land that I am giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you'll be on land that I have given you. And that was one of the verses that popped up in my heart as soon as I was uh, even, when this was brought up to, to speak in this service, this was the, the verse that popped up in my heart was, anywhere you set your foot. 
you'll be on land that I've given you. And we need to understand that as believers, that everywhere I go, he's with me. And I'm on his world, right? He put me here, right? And so anywhere I go, I'm on land that he's given me. Jump down to verse uh, 5. It says, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. For, you, for, for I will be with you as I was with Moses, and I will not fail or abandon you. Verse 6, this is where it gets good, guys. It says, be strong and courageous. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land that I swore to their ancestors I would give them. I want you guys to hear tonight, students, children, moms, dads, it's a time for us to grab onto this scripture and, and realize that God would look at us. I love this. This is like David, show, or the king shows up to, to, or the prophet shows up to David, and everybody's thinking he's going to say something, but I'm telling you, the message comes out that this is who you are. You're the king. And he comes to, to, to Gideon, and he says, you're a mighty man of valor. And he comes to Joshua in his moment of a dark hour. We're talking Moses, the man of God, right? Crazy miracles is gone. And God says, you're the one. You're the one. And I want you to hear tonight, you're the one. And so this is what God would say to you. He would say, be strong and be courageous, for you're the one who will lead these people to possess all the land that I swore to give them. Verse 7, he says, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions that Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. Guys, it's time in, this, in our lives, it's time to stop deviating. Stay on the focused route here. We got something to get done here. We got a king to get back into this planet, right? We ain't got time with wasting any more time. If it goes on into, uh, let me see here, verse, verse 8, it says, Study this book of instruction. Study the word of God continually. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. It says, this is my command. Be strong and courageous. And do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I believe with all my heart that there is to be revival in our schools this year. You know how it's going to start? You guys. Why? Because you're going to be bold. You're going to be courageous. You're going to do what God says. You're going to believe what God says about you. You're going to be that generation because that's who you are. And even though you may not feel like that, you need to hear it. That God will look at you today and he would say, be strong, be courageous. He's not looking for this right here. He doesn't look at you and go, man, you got a six-pack and ass, bro. You, you are strong. That's not impressive to God. He looks at the heart. And you could be, you could be little, a beanstalk, right? Just little arms, 110 pounds wet, right? And God could look at you and say, you're the one that will lead these people. And I believe, young people, that there are people, young people and adults, that you're to be leading. They're looking to you. And they need you and I to say, you know what? I'll be courageous. I'll confront. I'm not gonna let society tell me what the world's supposed to look like. A society that knows little to nothing about God. Try to tell me what God is and how he is and what he's all about. I know this God that I'm telling you about, right? So let's be strong. Let's be courageous, for we are the ones that God's going to use to get this job done. Amen? That's you guys. So, the grand finale. We got Pastor Nate and Evan coming up here. <laughs> you know, the fireworks are fun, but when the grand finale hits, everybody gets excited. <laughs> Give it up for Pastor Nate and Evan. Check. There I am. Man, I was just sitting there thanking the Lord for a children's ministry team led by Pastor Sheena and Pastor Ben and Joni with our youth and our youth team because it is the word that not just when you come in as adults, but it just blesses me so much to see that our, our children and our students are getting the word. I mean... To see that that foundation is starting when they're young is so valuable, so, so valuable. Um, so anyway, let's just give a hand clap for that. I'm just so thankful. So, so thankful. Okay, so can we have the piano just go ahead and come? Um, 
we're going to lay hands actually on um, every student um, all the way, you know, kindergarten all the way through, and then any faculty members, so coaches, um, teachers, any anyone who works at schools, we want to do that. Okay, so I think it's so cool to see how the Holy Spirit just leads because I did not talk to Sheena or <laughs> Pastor Ben and Joni, um, but just what came to me um, for today to, to share tonight is just believing the truth about what God says and how important it is to believe the truth that God says, not only to just believe it, but to speak it and declare it. And I am saying God is highlighting so much on declaring the word. And we talked about it in prayer last night. Pastor Nate asked, how many of you at, at night of prayer, how many of you have felt led or so strong in your hearts to give yourself more to prayer, which obviously means doing what, what Miss Erin talked about, declaring the word out. And you know how many people raise their hand? Probably like almost everyone at prayer last night. God, this is something the Holy Spirit's doing. And he's not just doing it here in our body. He's doing it across the body of Christ. Why? Because he wants his plan brought about here. And so I love just seeing boldness and students and youth and adults, everyone, being bold to do it. But you know what we need boldness a lot of times to do is to declare God's word when the situation looks different. To declare God's word when we're battling lies, to be able to be bold to declare God's word. So I'm going to read just two scriptures here. This talks about the devil. This is Jesus speaking. John 8, he said, you, uh, John 8, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Now he was talking here to people who were not born again. So how many of you know before we receive Jesus, we have that sin nature? Our father is the devil because we haven't been born again. So obviously we're serving that. But once you've been born again, that's not who you're serving anymore. So he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now this is so simple, but sometimes we have to get simple to understand. When the enemy comes to speak to you, it is a lie. We have to remind ourselves that when the enemy comes to whisper in your ear something, I have to tell myself that is a lie. And you know, sometimes I have to go beyond just thinking it. I have to vocalize it and say, that is a lie. And then what does it say? Jesus earlier said in John 8, 33, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what do we know? Jesus is the truth. The word of God is the truth. So what overcomes lies? Truth. So we have to speak the truth. This is a book. We actually got the second one. This is a brand new one that came out, but we have the first one. And um, we did this with our kids not too long ago. Um, if you want the resource, I can maybe, I don't know, just message me or come see it. It's out of Bethel. It's Steve Backland. It's let's just laugh at that for kids. But I'm telling you, this is powerful for adults. So what this is, is this is a book that shows different lies that the enemy tries to come with. How many of you have ever heard this lie before? My opinion doesn't matter. I can't overcome fear. I'm not a good friend. I'm a failure. No one likes me. I can't change. My teacher doesn't like me. The future doesn't matter. I can't do it. And on and on and on. You could have a list of lies that goes. But then what it has you do is it tells you a scripture that's a truth to do what? Combat the lie. So when that lie wants to come, and we can put this in our kids, students, you can do this. When you see a lie, and, and we asked our boys this, what are lies? And typically the, the devil doesn't come with 80 million lies to you. He'll come to Mona with a lie that he knows gets her. He'll come to Kylie with maybe a different lie that he knows affects her. And most of us in here, it's a couple different things that we can get hung up on every time. And so he'll come with that lie. But you know what the amazing thing is? When we recognize it as a lie and say, you know what? No, that's a lie. That's a lie. And for every lie, this is amazing. For every lie that the enemy comes with, there is always truth 
to combat it and to overpower it. We're not lacking for truth. We just have to do what? Know the truth. And when we know the truth and when we declare the truth, what does it do? It sets us free. So I just wanted everyone here tonight, this is your homework assignment. Everybody and parents, you can help do this with your kids. And you know what? It's okay to voice to your parents or to to your spouse and say, man, I've been battling this. This is a lie that the enemy has come. Recognize it as a lie. We're not declaring it over ourselves. This is a lie. You know, I'm not good enough or I always mess up or whatever it might be. Okay, but then let's go to the word of God. Let's find a scripture and let's combat that lie. Get it in our hearts so the next time the lie comes, I have that word down in my heart and the Holy Spirit does his job 100% perfectly all the time, where what's he going to do? He's going to bring that word up, and then what is it? It's our job to then take that word and voice it and overcome that lie. Isn't that amazing? So that's your homework. What are some lies or a lie, maybe just start with one, that the enemy comes at you with? And then you combat it with the truth. Not enough to just find the scripture. You find the scripture. You meditate on it. You look at it. You speak it out and you declare it. And you see that truth overcoming that lie. And then take a bold step, whatever it might be. I mean, tonight, I didn't really want to jump up and dance or do certain things or whatever it might be. But you know what? How you combat fear, you overcome it. Just like what Pastor Ben said, you're courageous. You do it. So if it's, I don't have a voice, no one listens to me, speak up. Whatever it is, you you overcome it with the truth, but then there's always action. Joshua, Caleb, Gideon, Moses, all these people, they had to overcome the lies with doing what? Taking a step, a bold step of faith and saying, I'm going to step out in this and thank you, Lord, you're there with me. Amen? Okay. So good. You know, she said... um Facing fear, and anytime fear is present, Satan's speaking. The wrong spirit speaking. Anytime, and it would be good for us to identify fear and and call it what it is. But she said, uh, "You face it, and then you do something." You know, faith always overcomes fear. And here's the simplest definition that I could explain to you what faith is. You know what it is? Acting, you acting like the Word of God is true. That's faith. Let me ask you. Are you acting like the Word of God is true concerning your finances? Are you acting like the Word of God is true concerning a virus? Are you acting like the Word of God is true concerning our nation? Are you acting like the Word of God is true concerning your future? Are you acting like the Word of God is true concerning your health and your body? That's called faith. And faith is the victory that overcomes any fight in this world. It's responding or you simply being a doer or putting action to the Word of God. Here's the thing. When you put action to the Word of God, you don't walk alone. Heaven's assistance is walking with you. When you take that step of faith or take that step of doing what God said, acting like the Word of God is true, He accompanies you. Anyway, praise the Lord. I wasn't going to teach on that. All I wanted to do is I wanted to uh, two things. Um, first, I want to address this because I heard this in my heart. I heard somebody uh, when she just said that about laying on of hands. Did you know the Bible tells us to lay hands on the sick and they would recover? So, and I just heard that like, oh, don't lay hands because what if someone gets sick? Listen, if everybody was sick... If every person in here had a virus, you know what we have been commissioned to do? Lay hands on that. There's not fear there. That's a raw, that's a lie. That's a lie. But I wanted to give you the word that tonight just about laying on of hands because I think sometimes it's good for us to have a little bit of an understanding 
uh, and I could give you a hundred scriptures about laying on of hands and how, and I love how the, the simply, even the, how the blessing was transferred and how you'll see that uh, Jesus had called the kids unto to him and he laid his hands upon them and blessed them. We see that you remember Abraham uh, and, and, and Isaac and Jacob. You remember when Jacob got the birthright and it was supposed to be Esau. What happened is Isaac, uh, he, he knew uh, um, Rebecca, I think it's Rebecca, Rachel, oh, I can't remember her name, but Isaac's, Isaac's wife, her son Jacob, she knew, they knew that, that Isaac was going to touch the son that he blessed. And so they put hair upon, goat's hair upon his arms because Esau was hairy and Isaac was not. And, they, and then he put on a, clo- a coat because he knew he'd, he would be able to tell. And so what happened is, is Isaac laid his, this is a principle that's in the word uh, from the very beginning of a transfer of blessing uh, or um, a, a, a declaration, but an impartation to prosper. So we see laying hands on to bless. But I wanted to hit on this one, um, and we see it for healing. Um, but I, I wanted to hit on this one about a gift, a gift given to you. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Now, Timothy was a young man. And where he was uh, set, he was sit, set in a place uh, where, in a sense, he was going out and almost felt alone in his approach. Um, uh, maybe felt, maybe his stance and his uh, declaration of faith. He, even Paul says, when I call to your remembrance, your unfeigned faith. Or when I call to your remembrance, faith that is actually active that first dwelt in your grandmother Lewis and your mother also, and now dwells in you. I'm watching you be a doer of the word, but yet he felt by himself oftentimes. And Paul wrote to encourage him, and he said, stir up again. Stir up, 1 Timothy 4.14, the gift. And I want to read this out of the Amplified. He says, uh, this is, uh, that's a different, uh, uh, a different verse. This is, this is first. Timothy 4.14, but he's talking about the, the, the gift that was given to you, the special inward endowment. There was a gift given to him, a special uh, inward endowment, which was directly imparted by the Holy Spirit, by prophetic utterance, when the elders laid their hands upon you. So there, there are times that that laying on of hands, we see this in the Bible. We see when when uh, the, the 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 disciples needed to be studying the Word and, and giving themselves to prayer, they found faithful, God fearing men, and they laid hands on these men, and they took over an area of ministry. So there was a, 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 a an impartation or a gift given to them for the advancement. In the very very next verse, in Acts six six, it tells us that the very next verse says that the gospel sped on after that. So there was a transfer or a deposit through the laying on of hands for something. Let me tell you, there is something for you and I to do. And guess what it's not going to be? Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, It's not by might, it's not by power, but it is by a gift that's given to you. It is by the Spirit of God that's on the inside of you. And, and you know, sometimes you might even feel, I love the, with the, the statement, what you see is, you you see seen a, a a young man by the name of David, who just like but he had a sp- different spirit about him. You you see you 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 see God calling. We we heard it to the heart to the inner man. That's what he was calling out to, and that's even the deposits that are given to you. And so tonight we're gonna lay hands on Pastor uh, Ben and Joni and and our our uh, Pastor Sheena. I, I don't know if just you or if anybody else is, uh, but we're gonna lay hands on you tonight. And here's what here's what I want you to put your faith in tonight: that you're gonna receive a spiritual deposit for the task at hand. Just as Paul spoke to Timothy, he said, I want, you to rem- I want to remind you about the gift, the deposit that was given to you to, to, to overcome the adversity and, the, and, and, and the, the days ahead. And I'm telling you, it's not going to be by your wisdom, not by your strength, what God's called you to do. It's going to be you relying 
from here and flowing out of your belly. I love the song that we sang first. Deep cry, deep's crying out to deep. Deep's crying out to deep. We're going into deeper waters. We're going in this verse, Zechariah chapter four six. You've heard it quoted, and I've, I just said, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. An angel comes to Zechariah. Or to, to Zerubbabel, really. Uh, Zechariah's the book. Zerubbabel, who's who he's talking to, and it's a leader that brings about the rebuilding of the temple. And this angel shows up to this leader, a, a, a man of God, a person that God positioned, just like you and I, in a community, in a city, to bring about God's plan, which was the rebuilding of the temple. And an angel showed up. And we just talked about this on Sunday. Lord, open our eyes like assistance, and it doesn't just happen there. God always is bringing assistance to you and me. But this angel shows up, and, and, and he shows a, a, a vision to, to, to Zerubbabel. And he says, what do you see? And what happens is, if you were to read Zechariah chapter 4 uh, all the way through the end, but just the beginning part, what well, before you get to uh, 6, he sees a candle with seven, seven candlesticks. And on either side of the candle is two olive trees. And on top of the candle is this bowl. And what's this picture is that there's this olive tree, which is what you get oil from. Okay? Anointing. Pow okay, they, all through the Bible, it's spirit. And, they're, and it's filling the bowl on top of the lamp, a never-ending supply. And the seven candlesticks are representative of what you see even in Revelation as the church. And it goes on to say that these two trees, this, the, 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 which would be the Spirit we see as it representing Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit would be an everlasting flow and it's flowing into the seven candlesticks. That's what we're talking about. And, and what's going to give light to all around and to the world, it's not going to be your and my awesome articulation of the Word of God, it is going to be that which is flowing into and out of our bellies, rivers, no, listen, the light in this world. You are the light of the world. These seven candlesticks in, in Revelation, it says, letters to the seven churches. Listen, you are the church. You are the light of the world. And so many times we approach school, we approach our, our, our job, we approach church, we approach pastoring in our own strength, and we don't draw on that which is within that I did not supply. No, it was trees that God set, planted these two Christ in me, the hope of glory, the Spirit of God, the power to be a witness, to testify that I don't have to make sure, listen, is there or doing its job to fill me. If I'm a child of God, His Spirit dwells in me. And you know what it takes you and my, me doing? Simply opening our mouth and trusting that He'll meet me there with words that would bring refreshing And so that's what I, we just, all of that talking about laying on the hands, a, 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 a spiritual deposit, a stirring up of a well, a breaking out, almost of like what you would, maybe some of you would um, know the story of Moses in the rock. And out of a rock, he struck the rock. He said, Lord, it's a dry place. There's nothing what are we going to do? Where are we going to get water? Maybe your school feels like that. Maybe your work, maybe everything's felt like that. And the Lord told him, hit the rock. I'm telling you, God has a plan when it even looks dry. He has a direction. He can bring about a flow in a dry and, 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 and desolate place and bring a life to all around, and what his design is, is to do it through the candlestick, or to do it through the churches, which it, or to do it through the church, which is not a body, or just an organization, it's individuals that make up the body, it's individuals in all walks of life, so we're going to do that everywhere you go, and, um, and we're believing for a spiritual deposit tonight, uh, amen, uh, Pastor Ben, Joni, Sheena, Ev, uh, kids, you want to give? Kids, you want to come forward? Staff, um, everyone.